from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Ahead today, K-State's Joe Jansen will discuss the probable market impact of another round of trade aid for farmers based on past experiences. He looks at the direct payment approach, which was taken last year, as well as many years of surplus grain purchases by the government for humanitarian purposes. Then we'll welcome back in Washburn University's Roger McOwen. He'll talk about the level of protection that right-to-farm laws provide to agricultural producers against nuisance claims. And he cites a very recent court decision in this area that seems to go against the grain. Further ahead with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven, along with much more here on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. listening to the K-State Radio Network and welcome once more to Agriculture Today. Of course, it has been at the top of the page for agricultural interests the last week or so. What's to happen with U.S. trade relations with China? We, of course, know about the tariffs and the disagreements between the two countries on settling the trade issues. There has been talk as well amidst this about potential compensation for agricultural producers who have lost trade business due to this ongoing trade flap. Lending some thoughts on that, including a historical perspective, if you will now, is Joe Jansen. He's an agricultural economist here at Kansas State University. Joe, you and and colleagues in your department are watching this whole scenario with great intent, aren't you? Absolutely. We know that whatever comes out of this situation will have a, a major impact on farmers in the state of Kansas and the agriculture industry more broadly. The most directly would be some kind of trade mitigation program or market facil- – we had a market facilitation program, which was essentially – last year, a program to compensate farmers for the negative impacts caused by the Chinese trade dispute. And so the president announced last year $12 billion, um, and and a significant portion of that has been paid out, and then more recently announced $15 billion this year in some way, shape, or form. We don't know that way, shape, or form yet, but some form of a compensation payment being made to farmers. The form of that is sort of a little bit unclear, And so when the president committed to do this, he suggested that the government may directly procure commodities from farmers and ship it abroad as aid. Other people have said it would look more like the market facilitation program that we had last year, which was a a direct payment to producers. So a lot of uncertainty about what form this will take. And, And the form that it takes really, I think, matters because it has a potential to affect markets to affect producer decisions and affect sort of how long this period of low prices in the farm sector lasts. If we might, we'll come back to the prospect of the MFP 2.0, to put it that way in just a second. But the U.S. has a historical track record of purchasing commodities from producers for humanitarian purposes. And it's worth reflecting on that, Joe. Yeah. So what the president said directly was that that we could buy commodities and distribute the food to starving nations around the world. And that was a significant part of U.S. agricultural policy back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The U.S. accumulated massive stockpiles of grain. And one way to, to move that grain was to give it away as aid. In the presence of those stockpiles had a negative impact on prices, right? It was very difficult for prices to rally when the market knew that there were significant stockpiles sitting there. And the prospect of higher prices, we would you know, release those stocks. And so that's sort of the, the potential here. The other idea is that we, would just, we could give this away. And the, the, whether that has some impact on price depends on sort of is that demand you know, represented by the U.S. procurement, is that going to 
represent new demand for the commodity or is that those purchases that would have been made already? And in the past, one of the sort of slights against giving away our commodities as, as aid was that it replaced a lot of commercial trade, trade that would have happened through commercial means. So it wouldn't necessarily take grain, soybeans off the market and wouldn't have a significantly positive impact on price. In fact, uh, it could have had a negative consequence, could it not? Then? Right, indeed. Indeed. The other sort of downsides of, of using aid as a means of surplus disposal like this would be that it's oftentimes not very well targeted towards the poor. So we're thinking about, well, when would the poor need food aid? It's probably not directly tied to when we have a trade conflict with China and we want to pull a lot of corn and soybeans off the market. That sort of also relates directly to like what form should food aid be in? And it's probably in a form that's you know directly consumable by consumers in, in developing countries and they're not consuming a lot of corn and soybeans. You know, those are generally feed grains. For that reason, not necessarily a good thing. And then the last thing would be that it's incredibly costly. And it's been shown that if we you know ship, say, $15 billion worth of, of grain as food aid, right, the actual cost is much higher because we incur higher costs in terms of, of shipping to get it to these, these markets. And we could you know, accomplish the same aid goal at lower cost if we procured the grains in other ways. So for all of those reasons, the United States gave up on using food aid as a means of surplus disposal. And in fact, we still do about a billion to a billion and a half dollars worth of, of food aid every year. Um, most of that is in the form of, of rice and wheat, and to a lesser extent, some of the pulse crops. So things like peas and lentils, which are, uh, we do grow a, a little bit of peas here in the state as well in Kansas. So some of that is going into that food aid market. But in all of those cases, it's much more directly tied to specific needs in developing countries and not just a means of getting rid of excess stocks, mm -hmm. if you it, will. It's much more involved. So that needs to be taken in consideration if, in fact, there's going to be some sort of program along this line established. It'll have to be a, a different tact, it would seem, Joe, for it to even work. Right. And so it seems much more likely that we'll see a series of direct payments, potentially in multiple stages, like we saw last year. I, mean, I think the goals of, of the USDA, from what I have seen, is that that program would be timely, that it would be offered now or as close to now as is possible, that it would not necessarily have a huge impact on producer planting decisions, that producers would still respond to market signals. But no matter what form it takes, I think it will have some impact and it will be a, a cause for a considerable debate. Uh, we saw last year, right, that there was a lot of animus between corn and soybean groups, where soybean groups are saying that the level of the payment was you know, significant and a help to us. And the corn group said, we're being impacted by this too, and yet we're not seeing compensation to the same degree as other commodities. So you have a lot of this who gets what debate. So if it's $15 billion, how does that $15 billion get doled out? And then does that correspond to the true market impact? And I think it's very difficult as economists, we're trained to sort of to try and estimate these impacts. And even still, we find it very, very difficult to say, well, how much of the decline that we've observed in soybean prices was related to con trade conflict with China relative to, say, the decline in the demand for soybeans as, as feed because of something like African swine fever? So when we did these market facilitation program payments the last time, one of the, th the key sort of indicators that the government used to, to set those payments was how dependent on trade a given commodity is. And so that's in part one reason why soybeans got a large payment because the U.S. soybean producer is very dependent on exports, whereas the U.S. corn producer is, is significantly less dependent on exports. And that was the criteria that was used at that time. Whether that will be the criteria again sort of remains to be seen. In all of that, we still don't know what role Congress might have. So one reason why the USDA can act so quickly is because they're working through the Commodity Credit Corporation, mm -hmm. which has the authorization to make payments like this without congressional approval, that they have a permanent authorization to fund their operations. But at some point, you would think that Congress and the various interests that are represented by different people in Congress might want to have a say in terms of how much payment 
goes where. And look at the mechanisms that make that determination and, and perhaps tweak them a little differently than what MFP, the first version, was all about. Mm-hmm. But again, as you said, Joe, what's interesting here is we are still in the midst of planting season and there are complicating factors with planting delays and the decisions maybe being changed. So this is a time of, as you well put it, tremendous uncertainty. And what this does is lends even more uncertainty to the situation. Indeed. I think depending on the timing of how this this process plays out, it, it could have bigger or smaller impacts on planting and storage decisions that happen in this year. And I think the one, the, the biggest source of uncertainty is when something that we, we don't expect comes along. So if you know we made decisions to store soybeans last year on the basis of an expected return, because if we hold it for a, a, you know a given period of time, we expect you know the price will get better if we wait. Well, something could come along and change that could dramatically change those returns to storage, and that's where I see sort of the potential uncertainty and the potential negatives of uncertainty having an effect on, on the producer. And how important is this? Well. The Kansas Farm Management Association's new net farm income number just came out last week, and the average net farm income in Kansas was $100,000, but the market facilitation program payments made up 37% of that figure. I mean, the one issue that we didn't mention about the program was that last year the program paid out on the basis of actual production. Mm -hmm. So you needed to have bushels to get a payment. And a lot of producers said it wasn't necessarily fair or just for a producer who had you know, a bad crop because of weather to not get a payment. And that could create the possibility that this year you might want to make sure that you have a crop when maybe you wouldn't have necessarily planted in order to take advantage of the program, in order to get something out of the program. What happens from here is no small potatoes, Joe, and you'll be monitoring it very closely. We'll see what's announced and maybe have you back for an analysis at that time. Thank you. Thank you for coming by. Joe Jansen with us, agricultural economist, Kansas State University. Once more, some thoughts on what form of relief might be forthcoming from the administration as compensation for lost trade business for agricultural commodities over the ongoing trade dispute between the U.S. and China. We'll be back with more on agriculture today after this over the K-State Radio Network. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today and uh, glad to have you back. And we're also happy to have aboard once again Roger McCohen, Professor of Agricultural Law and Taxation at the Washburn University School of Law. Roger, we're going to return to the topic of nuisance and the protection provided to agricultural producers by right-to-farm laws across this nation, certainly here in Kansas. You might get into the basic makeup of those laws and how they do provide some uh, buffering, if you will, for producers. Well, that's right, Eric. Every state has a right-to-farm law, and basically what they're designed to do is protect existing ag operations by giving the farmers and ranchers that run those operations and meet the legal requirements of the particular state statute, a defense in nuisance suits. So if they're sued on a nuisance theory by somebody that moves in after the farming operation has been there for a specified period of time, usually at least a year, then they can raise the right to farm statute as a defense. It's basically, uh, we could think of it as a coming to the nuisance defense. In other words, the plaintiff you came to the ag area, you can't sue me on the basis or on the claim on the assertion that I am a nuisance because I was here first. That's the basic idea behind right to farm statute. Something that we might plug in here, a producer is allowed protection only if it is a bona fide farming activity. That is stressed in the law, you say. 
Yeah, that's right. You have to be conducting your operation with all of your necessary permits, if there are any that are required, uh, using good farming practices, good husbandry practices, and not be operating in a negligent fashion. If that's the case, then what this says, if somebody comes to you after you've been established as, as your farming operation, they can't sue you on a nuisance theory. Well, let's go to the state of Indiana and uh, a recently ruled upon court case that looks at coming to the nuisance as a defense in reverse, and you'll explain in just a moment. There have been to set this up right-to-farm rulings that have once again reaffirmed this protection for producers. That's right. Indiana, in recent years, last four or five years, has had several nuisance-related cases uh, involving confinement operations. And that's usually where we see these cases, at least in recent years, with uh, particularly hogs put in um, large-scale confinements and, of course, the associated odors. That's the problem. Well, Indiana has a right-to-farm statute, and it has uh, an exception that's contained in it, as many states do, for the farmer to be able to utilize that right-to-farm defense. There is an exception that applies, and if the exception applies, then you cannot use the defense in a nuisance action. And that is that the Indiana law only allows a nuisance claim when significant change occurs, such as um, I've increased substantially the number of head of livestock in my confinement building, I've materially changed my operation in a way after somebody moved in close to me that I should no longer, it no longer makes sense for me to be able to raise the right to farm statute as a defense. In other words, it's a different scenario than when the neighbor moved in next to me. I've materially changed my operation, or as the Indiana statute says, I have substantially changed my operation. You do that after somebody moves in next to you, you can't use the right to farm statute as a defense against the nuisance action. A couple of these cases, though, have indicated it, that if it, in fact, is an expansion of an existing operation, that expansion would be protected by the right to farm statutes, right? Yeah, the Indiana courts have seemed to um, say that the exception for substantial change really doesn't apply in the vast majority of situations. They, and they're, but they really hadn't put their finger on where the line is between what is a substantial change and what is a, 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 an insubstantial change. And they just said that in the cases that they've had before them in recent years since that statutory amendment was put in, that uh, they haven't had one where there's been a substantial change, and so they've allowed farmers to utilize the right to farm defense. That brings us to this case, which was ruled upon just uh, this past month in Indiana, and you call it the coming to the nuisance defense in reverse. What were the details behind this, Roger? Well, I think it is uh, in reverse. I've never really seen a case like this before, but uh, what happened here was in 2013, the defendants in this case, the farming operation, petitioned their county area plan commission to rezone a 58-acre tract from ag residential to ag intense because they wanted to put in hog confinement. So they had to go through the county and get a zoning change. The land, and this is the interesting thing about this, the land had been in the family for over 20 years and had been used for ag purposes since at least 1941. And this tract was a, a part of a larger tract that the family members involved had owned for quite some time. Now, from 94 to 2013, the property was cropland, so the zoning change again is going to allow that CAFO to go in there. The plaintiffs in this case were two married couples, one of whom built their non-farm residence in 1971, and the other who started their, their using their home as a non-farm residence in 2000 after deciding to retire from farming and sell most of the farmland that the husband had grown up on and lived on since the early 1940s. See, he was born here. He's part of the same family that the defendants are part of. They're family members here. So he decides in 94 that he's going to retire. He sells off some of the land to the other family members so that they could continue farming that, but he stays on the premises that he had grown up on. The farm home was built in 1926. He was born there in the early 1940s and continued to live there. Well, uh, the the long story short, the defendant part of the family, uh, they go ahead and get the zoning change. They put in you know, two 4,000 head hog confinements about a quarter mile from the plaintiff's house. Um, he sued for nuisance, and long story short, the Indiana Court of Appeals said, well, you came to the nuisance. Even though, keep in mind, he's lived there his whole life, 
they said that your change from ag to just having a rural residence occurred after the existing ag was established in the area, and they took that back all the way to 1941. And then they said that two 4,000-head hog confinement buildings is agriculture just like agriculture in this area was in 1941. So therefore, he came to the nuisance. Well, your observations about the implications of this ruling suggest that it it sets something of maybe an improper tone as far as interpreting right-to-farm laws, Roger. Well, I I think the key language in the statute, uh, which is substantial change, has just simply been read out, in essence, by the Indiana Court of Appeals. And again, what that means is, if the area or if the farming operation has undergone a substantial change after some non-farmer moves in nearby, then that removes the protection of the right to farm statute for the farmer. Well, obviously, the legislature put that in the statute for some reason. So substantial change means something. And my point is, if two 4,000 head hog confinements is not a substantial change from row crop farming dating back to the 1940s, I really don't know what is. So my question here to the court is, where do you draw the line? Or are you saying that substantial change doesn't mean anything and we're just going to read it out of the statute? From the statutory construction standpoint, I think that's wrong because words mean things and and legislators put words in statutes to mean something, and the courts have to figure that out. I'm not sure they figured it out. My point is I think they may have just simply read it out of the statute. This may, in fact, ascend to the Indiana Supreme Court, perhaps, because of its its, uh, contention here. What this says, again, this was an Indiana case, what this says to producers here in Kansas, though, they need to be familiar with the right to farm laws and and the extent to which that protection goes. That's right. Well, we have a similar defense in the Kansas statute. Uh, If you've been an operator, you've been operating a year, you've got all your federal and state permits, you're not operating negligently, you're using good husbandry practices, you can use the right to farm statute and the coming to the nuisance uh, defense. Uh, You were there first. You shouldn't be sued by somebody that moves in and complains that you're a nuisance. But again, you got to meet those requirements. We really haven't in Kansas had a similar fact pattern to this Indiana case. In fact, I really can't find one anywhere else that looks like they've, uh, to me, applied the coming to the nuisance defense in a backward fashion. It's a really unique set of facts. And we'll have to see first if the Court of Appeals agrees to rehear it with the full panel Absent that, we'll know that probably next week. Absent that, uh, we'll see if the Indiana Supreme Court takes it. Um, If it comes out the same or they decline to take it, then it's going to be up to the Indiana legislature to see if they need to re-examine the statute again. Because in essence, you know, the court may actually be correct in its read of the statute. Mm -hmm. Then the legislature, if that's the case, has to determine if that's the correct policy. And policy decisions are appropriately decided by legislatures and not courts. Well, again, Roger has written on this subject in his blog, which is available to you producers at washburnlaw.edu slash W-A-L-T-R, among many, many other cases and topics. Have a look at that, washburnlaw.edu slash W-A-L-T-R. Always insightful. Roger, thanks for joining us once again. Thank you, Eric. Professor of Agricultural Law and Taxation at the Washburn University School of Law and an adjunct professor here at K-State. Roger McCohen, you're tuned to Agriculture Today. Now this break, we'll be back with today's agricultural news headlines for you. And again, awaiting with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas, Gus Vanderhoven. Still ahead here on the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station.
You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, our Wednesday edition. Thanks for joining us once more. Eric Atkinson here. On to today's agricultural news headlines, now courtesy in part of DTN. Senate Agriculture Appropriations Subcommittee Chairman John Hoven of North Dakota said yesterday that he hopes that within a week or so, the Trump administration will announce a program of trade aid to farmers due to the Chinese tariffs on U.S. farm products. Hoven also said the trade aid could total more than the $12 billion that the administration allocated in the first round of trade aid spending this year and could be as high as the $15 billion that President Trump had mentioned. Hoven said the aid probably would be in the form of the market facilitation payments and government purchases of farm products that was used in the first round of aid. The money would come from the Commodity Credit Corporation, the USDA account, that allows the department to spend up to $30 billion on aid to farmers each year. If the spending hits the $30 billion limit, Hoven said, the Supplemental Appropriations Disaster Aid Bill would provide more. Now, Hoven did not say whether the formula for payments to producers would be different from the formula that was used for payments to farmers earlier this year. That formula benefited soybean growers the most because they are the biggest exporters to China. Producers of other commodities complained that that was not equal treatment. Hoven said he has been working on the aid package aggressively for several weeks and spent the last week at the White House lobbying. The program, he says, is justified because, quoting him, our farmers are being targeted by the Chinese. Now, the tweet by President Trump that the U.S. might buy up commodities and donate them is appearing to be waning as a possibility. U.S. law requires an analysis of whether the receiving country would be able to store the inbound foodstuffs or to prevent them from rotting and for the U.S. to assess whether that aid would undermine local farmers. That's according to a report by the Congressional Research Service. Expectations are that other exporting countries would likely raise objections to any such program as export subsidies, which are banned under World Trade Organization rules. Meantime, China has announced that as of June the 1st, it would raise tariffs on $60 billion of U.S. goods. The tariff increases would hit a wide range of sectors, ranging from manufacturing to agriculture and household goods. China said 2,500 items coming from the U.S. would see tariffs of 25 percent, including agricultural products and more. However, the president said that he would meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping while at the G20 summit in Japan in late June and would hopefully talk more trade then. Despite the recent setbacks in U.S.-China trade negotiations, the top USDA trade official is still expressing optimism that there will eventually be a deal. Here's more from the USDA's Gary Crawford. Many of us not in the inner loop of the U.S.-China trade negotiations were a little startled at last week by what seemed to us as a sudden pothole on the road to a trade agreement with China. But the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Undersecretary for Trade, Ted McKinney, says what happened was... Not surprising. Not surprising. McKinney telling a group of farm broadcasters at USDA headquarters that during the last couple of agricultural negotiating sessions with China... We sensed this backsliding starting, and then we compared our notes with other teams So there was distinctly uh, a change uh, of views by our friends in China. And now we have tariffs being raised on Chinese goods. China putting out lists of U.S. food and ag products it is targeting with tariffs. McKinney says a U.S.-China trade deal now seems further away than before. But I still am optimistic that we will get there. In Washington, Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Well, amid all of the dialogue over the U.S.-China trade talk collapse and with little notice, the House passed a disaster relief bill with more funding for Puerto Rico. Bloomberg also reports that in spite of Republican opposition, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is now urging lawmakers to come together on a bipartisan disaster relief bill, saying that Americans who have suffered have been waiting too long for relief, in his words. The House overwhelmingly passed the $19 billion 
billion relief bill on Friday to provide federal aid to communities and military installations hit hard by natural disasters. Uh, Ignoring the president's opposition to the package over its assistance for Puerto Rico. In the debate, the president told Republicans to reject that disaster bill, but the House did not, and neither did 34 Republicans who joined all of the chamber's Democrats to pass the package, 257 to 150. Some of the most loyal conservative supporters broke with the president, favoring their district's needs over his demands. Among those were Representatives Steve King of Iowa and lawmakers from Nebraska, Georgia, and Texas. Now, the strong bipartisan vote reflected the anger and frustration of constituents as the disaster relief legislation has stalled in Congress for months. Senate Republicans have failed to come up with an alternative package in their negotiations with the White House. Representative Jeff Fortenberry of Nebraska, whose state, of course, experienced severe flooding in March, spoke in favor of a bipartisan amendment to add money for watershed protection and then voted for the underlying bill. The House bill is a revised version of the one passed in January that was not taken up by the Senate over objections to the additional Puerto Rico aid. The bill's chances look a lot better than they did a few days ago, as the Senate now appears ready to move quickly on the issue. Some farmers are asking for more liberal prevented planting provisions this year because of the adverse planting conditions. With more on that, again, the USDA's Gary Crawford. Richard Fordyce runs the USDA's Farm Service Agency. He also has a farm in northwest Missouri. He was back there this past weekend. And it is wet, like the top of a hill has water standing on it. And with flooding in a lot of places across the country, continued rain, many farmers have their tractors just parked. Some are looking up now the prevented planting provisions in their crop insurance policies. Ford Ice's boss, Undersecretary Bill Northey, says as far as prevent planting goes. Right now it's a standard provision. 55% of what your coverage level is in crop insurance is what you can expect to receive if you're not able to get that in by the final plant date. Some farmers are asking for more liberal provisions this year, but Bill Northey says in the new farm bill, it keeps those provisions as they were in the 14 bill. And I don't see any extra help right now uh, that Congress did in the most recent disaster bill either. Not in the bill the House passed. It could crop up in the Senate bill, but it's been stalled for months. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. And of course, pay a visit to your local farm service agency office for more discussion over the prevented planning alternatives that are afforded you producers. That's a glance at today's agricultural news headlines. Once more, if you've not checked out our podcast service, please do so. You can find it at agtoday.net. You can listen to the podcast right there or subscribe to automatic delivery of our broadcast each day on your mobile device at agtoday.net. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. The small yard, a front yard, I looked at was 16 feet deep and 17 and a half feet wide. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. Of course you say, yes, I will help you. Send some photographs and, of course, give the measurements. I'm talking about a request to help with landscape plan for the row house of my Dutch friend she recently bought. For the Netherlands, it's a nice house. It's small, as many things are in the Netherlands. Being a row house and not a house standing by itself on some acreage. She has visited us many times. At one time, she was an exchange student. She knows how we live on our few acres here near town. And as we emailed each other, she repeatedly reminded me, Gus, 
Remember, it's just a post-stamp area. But remember, sometimes on a small one-by-one-inch postage stamp, a whole mountain range or vast prairie landscape has been shown. Landscaping can use some of the same principles, give the feeling of a small space to be bigger. In exact measurements, the side from corner to diagonal corner is already longer than just across from side to side. Also, use a plant with coarse texture, big leaves close by, and fine texture at the other end, so that it seems further away. There's no deception, only understanding of space, relation, facts. So keep an elephant ear close to you, and in the distance look at the small leaves of asparia or asparagus. The small yard, front yard, I looked at was 60 feet deep and 17 and a half feet wide. There was a brick path from the walk and parking area to the front door. The plant material that was standing in the limited space was shorn evergreens, which made it all look somber and like a cemetery. It needed work. It needed work looking toward the house, making the enters welcome. And it needed a heck of a lot of work looking out of the picture window, into the small yard and beyond. I had several photos of the front of the house, and I know what a Dutch house can look like. For several days, I kept looking at the photos, and most important, I tried to get a firm hold on how small this piece of property was, and how functional. It was like the Panama Canal, allowing you to get from here to there, the parking lot to the front door. Oh yes, my friend had no mower, and little time besides all the other things she was involved in. I also know she had high expectations I could solve this challenge. Not a problem, just a challenge. Of course, the map I received with the measurement was all in meters and centimeters. Not a problem. I changed all that in feet and inches. With those measurements, I did get a better feel for the place. But here is a big issue. What does the client want? If you sit across from each other at a table, you talk, and above all, you listen. You slowly get the information which helps you as a designer to start the process. The site does tell you a few things. Slope, exposure, soil, etc. Somewhere I have a booklet with 100 garden designs for the same small plot of land. That should tell you something. I did not look for the booklet. I did not need it, as I saw the beginning of a design solution for this small project in my mind. I continued to work it out before I placed pen on paper. I did pull a few Dutch garden design books from my shelf to help me with selecting and naming plant material. You need to be able to communicate about plant material. Thank goodness plants have Latin names. And that works internationally. Thank you, Linnaeus, for organizing this crazy plant world. The plant, Rus Typhina dissecta, is a small sumac tree, which I did project in the landscape to create some privacy for the big picture window and for the one chair placed in the far corner to look out across the front yard to another larger but still small tree. It is placed in the other, far away corner. And I gave a few choices. Mountain ash, red bud, Chinese fringe tree. These are all small trees, as is the golden rain tree. And a few shrubs and much ground cover. There's one ground cover I should remove from the list, but I love it. It is Houtenini, in a popular version, but Hutania cordata chameleon. The trouble with it is that once planted, it takes off. 
I can see the whole street on the right side being overtaken by this aggressive, beautiful grower. It is the colored leaves which are fascinating to me. But we can take Vinca Minor as the chosen ground cover. Helping people design their property for them should be your aim, though. I'm sure my friend and I will be sending emails back and forth. And as we do, we will get closer to what she wants and needs. The funny thing is, I'm very sure of a few key plans I already have drawn in on the plan. We can still change species or cultivars, but that is where a tree is such, and such characteristics should be placed. Remember what I said about texture. Coarse, close by, fine in the distance, to make it seem that the distance is further. And by the way, I have not asked what her budget was. It all does not need to be planted the very first year. There are birthdays, but I can guarantee you that the property value will be much improved, and that it is good wherever you are. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. That's our time for today. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.